Joe Gross, the ELA probate expert. And this is our Tuesday, 3 p.m. Real estate investing Zoom, where we get together every Tuesday to talk about all things real estate investment, from short-term Airbnb stuff, fix and flips, multifamilies, uh, and we renew vendors who can help us along the way. All things real estate. We have real estate agents, investors, wholesalers. And our goal here really is just to get together and share information and networking to help all of us make more income and build more long-term wealth. Those are the two goals, income and wealth. And, we want, and most of us need to do both of those. Anybody here need more income? I'm just curious real quick. Want to raise your hand or put in the chat box me or you're unmuted, say I if you want to say I. Anybody need more income? Is it just me? Not just me? Okay. And anybody, uh, maybe you can still answer this. So anybody else, who needs more long-term wealth? Say I. Anybody want to say, yeah, yeah, more wealth. So I think we all, we all would like to make more income and more wealth in less time if we had that choice as well, right? So good, you're in the right room and we want to do it all together. So um, today I want to talk about really uh, something, I, you know, I say this all the time. I know I see here Lion and, um, uh, oh, your wife's name, it's been a while, Karen? Um, uh, Lion and, oh my gosh, Candy. Candy. It's been a while, it's been a while. Uh, see you guys on the call or I uh, see Lion on the call. Um, and I say this all the time, which is, I've been in real estate since 1986, and this is the best time ever to make money in real estate. And that's been true nonstop for the last two and a half years. And you might say, well, Bill, how can you say that today? I got that maybe when the pandemic hit. I'll think about that one for a second, when the pandemic hit. Or last year, when it seemed like the pandemic was <laughs> under control. I don't know what that really means. Or now the pandemic is almost gone, whatever that means. Here's what I'm going to say to you. There has never been more money looking for returns ever than right now. That's why we're having inflation. There is more money sloshing around the economy looking for a place to go. Some went into the stock market, and that's adjusting back. A lot went to crypto. That's adjusted back a bit, but still a lot of a fortune of money has gone into crypto. A lot has gone into real estate. That's why prices have gone up. Luxury goods, every luxury market, collectibles, watches, has got cigars. Dave's talking about his cigar night. Cigars have gotten more expensive, more luxury goods being bought, everything. And yet people still need to make more money every month. They still need income every month. And that could be from cash flow from investments, um, or that could be a job or income or business that yields you money on a regular basis. But there's never been a bigger opportunity with more cash than right now, number one. Number two, in my lifetime, maybe since 2008, with the exception, there has never been more uncertainty or less certainty in the marketplace. True or false? Right? I mean, so the week of the pandemic and that whole period, we didn't know where things were headed. But this has gone on now for two years. And really, are we going to World War III or not? I don't know. Is inflation going to run out of control or come out of control? I don't know. Or does the stock market go up or down? No idea. Real estate up or down? Yeah, one or the other. And if you have certainty on a certain plan that will yield you a certain result, there's more money than ever behind that plan right now. Now, at the same time, I want to say to you, it's gotten tougher. I've talked to people on this call. I think Lee is one of them. Uh, a couple others. Well, to me, the margins gotten tougher on their businesses. Right? Airbnb was an easier solution, I think, a year or two ago than it is today. True or false? Okay, it doesn't mean it's gone away. Airbnb is still worth billions of dollars. So the business got tougher. So here's what I, wouldn't, I will say is all businesses are getting tougher all the time. You have to understand that you don't just have to watch the business get tougher. You have to get better. I'm going to share with you a couple of stories. One story is, as a saying, in the world of the blind, the one-eyed man reigns king. What does that mean? Everybody's blind, and you have an eye, you see things they can't, people will turn to you for help. So let me give you an, let me give you an empirical example of this. In 1980, one of the best business books ever written was called In Search of Excellence. It was written by a consultant from a Kinsey company that consulted with the top Fortune 50 companies in America. And they selected what they thought were the best 50 companies in America and examine why they were successful. Now, these are big businesses, not small. 
but they're looking for principles that apply. So a number of them fit the same category as McDonald's. McDonald's at that time was profitable, worth a lot of money, growing consistently. Maybe today you'll think of it as a prestigious growth business, but it was thought that 40 years ago when the book was written. What do you think they cited as McDonald's strengths in 1980? Anybody know, want to guess? What was the strength that made McDonald's so successful? Anybody want to unmute themselves? Raise your hand, wave your hand. I'll try to catch you and unmute you. Anybody have an idea? What was about McDonald's? What, did they make the best hamburgers? Consistency. Consistency. And what allowed them, Steffi says real estate. It's true, they're a real estate company. That's true. Jess says affordable. Dave says consistency. The factors that made them consistent and affordable in the mind of the author who studied the best business America was, they had a very, very limited menu in those days. You had cheeseburger, filet of fish, Big Mac, quarter pounder, fries, a couple other things. It was revolutionary when they added the Egg McMuffin. Now I, I keep kosher, I don't eat McDonald's regularly, but I know I've been in there a few times so, or come by their kiosk at times. Is McDonald's menu now a lot bigger than it was before or is it a lot, lot bigger than it was before? Right, a breakfast, just egg McMuffin. So they have a whole bunch of breakfasts and exotic coffees and all kinds of other stuff, fruits and Danish. So why do you think McDonald's had to change from what was obviously a winning formula of limited products uh, choices to broadening their menu? Why do you think that was? Competition. adapting competition adapting the business got tougher every business gets tougher all the time because as soon as you're successful someone looks at you and goes oh wow i can copy that or i can copy them and make this one improvement right so it's a success is a process not a destination income and wealth are processes not destinations and so it is with real estate it's a mistake that so many people make and i you know, I make myself available for new people to call me all the time. And, and anybody here is welcome to go on my social media and you can reach out to me and I'll book a free 15 minute consult with you. No charge. Even if you're not going to buy anything, I don't care or sell anything. I don't care. But, but I often get the same question was what's the easiest way to make money in real estate? And I always answer the easiest way to make money in real estate is to work hard every day. If you're hard on yourself, then the rest of the business will be easier. Let me just share with you. Now, I've been in business since 1986. I made a lot of money this year, and I'm ahead of that pace already. I'm sorry, I made a lot of money last year and the year before, and I'm, I'm paced to beat that this year, easily. But this is what a listing looks like. Now, there are people who don't go into probate, and they'll say, well, that sounds difficult, challenging. The properties are hard. The people are hard. So I did a video on this earlier this week, but I'd like to share with you what this listing looked like. I made a list of what I'm gonna call the challenges or obstacles. One, before the attorney called me, referred me to the seller, it had already been listed in the MLS. The seller said they didn't know how, they didn't intend to, they had been discussing with his real estate agent and somehow they think the real estate agent assumed they go along with them and put it in the MLS. And for about 150,000 less than it was worth. So is that good news or bad news if you're a real estate agent to find out the property is already on the market and for $150,000 less than you would list it for? Is that good news or bad news? Yeah, you gotta solve some problem there, right? You have to talk to the broker or the MLS or something's gonna go on. Number two, the seller's out of state. Does that make it easier or harder to communicate with them and work with them? If they're older, especially, you can't drive by and sign documents or drop off documents. Three, my seller was disabled. She was deaf and her daughter had to help her with all the paperwork. Daughter would read it, explain it to her. Number four, in the property, we had a squatter, ex-girlfriend of the deceased, who thought she had a right to be there. Oh, everybody thinks they have a right to everything when they want it. But she also was a criminal. She had been arrested literally twice in the prior six months we could document. So I'm not talking about jaywalking and being arrested. I'm talking about legitimately arrested for some bad stuff. Don't want to go into that. Number five, we knew that this person 
had embezzled funds from our decedent. She had taken his ATM card before he passed, hit it for a few weeks, he died, hit it for a few weeks until the bank turned it off. Is that good news or bad news? Right, the state has less money, a little more tense. Number six, property didn't have insurance on it. Property burns down, big problem, so you have to get insurance. Is it easy to get insurance when the seller is out of state and disabled and has no money? Not easy, right? You gotta get insurance. Number seven, the home is vacant because we kicked out the squatter. You gotta change insurance, now it's vacant. That's harder to get. Take some specialized insurance. Eight, there was trash everywhere. Where do you get the trash out to sell the house? Nine, underneath the trash, where guess what? What do you think hangs out in a house full of trash with food and stuff? What do you think is in there besides, besides the trash? What kind of living animals do you think? Rats, cats, all kinds of scary stuff. We had cats, we had to call, uh, we'd, we'd have pest removal and got some cats out and some rats out. 10, we want to do an estate sale though because there's stuff that was worth money there. So we had to arrange that. So they need time to set up. They need, of course, neighbors come in, they're nosy. Squatters friends come back, try to get in the house, steal some things from the house. That causes problems. Number 11, among the things in the house are guns. Now, I like guns, but I don't like guns in houses that are vacant. Who likes knowing that you're, client has guns in a vacant house and you're responsible for it. <laughs> Not good, right? So you have to find a federally licensed gun dealer to take them and buy them from your client. And then number 12, one of the guns has the serial numbers uh, taken off. Is that good news or bad news? It's illegal to possess. <laughs> well, if you own it, don't tell anybody it might be good news, Sean, but to own it for somebody else, it's illegal. You have to call the, the police department and they'll come confiscate it. You really can't even drive it to the police department. They want to come out and pick it up and see what else you have. 13, the house had equipment that the family members wanted to keep. They had some um, um, metal working equipment that they had a certain uh, family right, commitment so. to, family uh, remembrance of. Yeah, okay. Had to be dealt with. 14, personal effects. The uh, decedent was a war hero. He had uh, ribbons and, and medals and flag and he had accommodations and all kinds of personal items have, that they wanted to keep. 15, to move out some of the equipment, there was, they had created a concrete wall. And so we had to remove this concrete wall just to get some of the equipment out of the house. So again, a contractor to get set up to get that done. 16, we had to store some of the stuff, equipment and personal effects. 17, the client didn't have any money. They had the money, the cash got embezzled. We got money from the state cell, but before that, they had no cash to pay for any of this. 18, there's multiple errors. So when you have multiple errors, let me ask you this. Does, does all your family members, they all get along together all the time? Dave say no. Dave's on mute, but I know his answer. You know, I get along with my sister and brother most of the time, but you put some money on the table, we'll find something to disagree about, right? Multiple errors is just uh, the longer, the longer there are multiple errors, the longer, uh, the, the, the shorter you are to problems. So I felt like we had the ticking time bomb. Number 19, the loan was in default because the guy passed, he wasn't paying the mortgage. So what happens when you don't pay the mortgage? Does the bank say, oh, take your time. Here's a toaster, right? Here's a free trip to, to Arizona on us. Relax, take some vacation. Just pay us back whenever you have a chance. Is that how the banks act today? No, not good. Number 20, then they filed a notice of default. So being in default, not making payments is one level. But then when they file a notice of default, that's a public filing. And the concern is, well, if the buyer sees that they might use as leverage to negotiate the deal, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But certainly that was a concern I had as an agent. Number 21, the lender then sells the servicing to another company. In the old days, when you had a loan with, say, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they would go through the foreclosure process. They all got such bad press. What they do now is there's companies who all they do is foreclose. They're usually law firms. They have the conscience of Vladimir Putin. These are really lovely people. And they'll, they'll just move the loan through to foreclosure as hard as they can, as fast as they can, charging as much as they can, knowing they're going to get reimbursed whatever legal fees there are when they foreclose. So we had a bank lined up for a payoff and they go, oh, the payoff's no longer good. You have to go to these guys. We went to them and they told us it would take five to seven business days to get a payoff. So here we have a, a buyer rate of close, loan documents at escrow. 
five to seven days before we can get a payoff. They said, well, we're a little behind. Like to get a payoff, we're here to pay you your money. You've been threatening foreclosure. Well, we'll get to as quickly as we can. I had to escalate it. Of course, these companies like PHH Mortgage, they don't have Twitter accounts. They try to hide behind being anonymous. So I found them, I found the guy, lit him up on Twitter and they big mercy and they got us to pay off. Number 22, have interest rates been going up or down? Anybody paying attention to this? Up. So if you're a buyer buying a property and you have loan documents in escrow, how are you feeling about a payoff taking an extra two or three days? And your loan, loan rate lock looking expired. Is that good news or bad news? If you're the buyer's agent, are you feeling comfortable with that or are you panic? You might lose your paycheck after all this time. Right? So those are 22 obstacles, 22 potential problems, 22 issues that we dealt with on top of the normal stuff. I had to get the contract, put the MLS, lockbox, showings, and go all the normal stuff we do. And those are 22 things that normally don't happen on most common transactions, true or false. Some of those things happen, but you really get that many all in one deal. And so here's my point after all that. A couple of things are true. One is I got paid because I, all I had to do was solve these problems. That's just what I had to do. Do I like having to solve all the problems? Did I like that the, that the squatter was there? Did I like that she embezzled money from the client? No. Would I choose for her to do that? No. But guess what? If I solve that problem and the others, what happens? I get paid. Right? It's like a puzzle. Put the puzzle together. At the end, you get paid. So at the end of the day, we sold the property. It had been listed for $450. We sold it for $599. My client got an extra $149,000. The estate sell covered all their expenses plus about $13,000 cash. So I got them about an extra $162,000 net. And, and people say, oh, Bill, you know, you're so rough. This poor squatter lady, you know, she's poor, downtrodden, homeless lady here in LA. Well, the decedent's wife is in an uh, old age home, not the kind you get when you pay and go and you have money and you save for your whole life. She's the one where you're, you're basically a welfare. And you have, there's no place else for you to live. And meanwhile, her husband had this house and she had money. And she could have gotten better medical care, been in a nicer home or whatever, enjoyed life. But the squatter is the one who, who delayed this process. So I try to remember my job is to take care of my client. And if we play by the rules, we'll all come up ahead better. The only reason the squatter only wasted money, time, effort, and energy for everybody for a few extra weeks of, of living in somebody else's house that they'd stolen time in. So at the end of the day, my client got an extra $162,000. That attorney already referred me one more listing. I have two more hot leads. So if you said to me, well, Bill, that's a lot of work for a commission check. Was it worth it to me? I guess it depends on how hard it was to clear those items. The truth is, in my case, I, I work I'm with a company where I found a partner to help me on the deal. She was the boots on the ground, handled a lot of the at the house stuff. I held the attorney and the client. And then the day we both get paid and we get more business. So that's what real estate looks like. There are a lot of realtors who would have fooled their tent halfway through this deal, including the one that listed the property. She just tried to shortcut it by listing it for 450. And she had a friend who'd pay cash for 450. Of course, that was a good deal. But looking back on this, maybe if you would offer 550, would that, have been, would that have been a better deal for the homeowner? And it probably would have made her home a better deal for the investor. They would have got the property because as it is, the investor didn't get the property. They're going to buy the property. He's going to fix it up and sell it and make a nice profit on it. Okay, so I went through a list of problems. Any questions on those problems? Any, anything not make sense? Anything sound? Does this sound like, is this normal? Is this kind of business you deal with? Or does this sound like a little more, a little more problems than my, you might normally have? But here's what I'm going to tell you. Learn to embrace the suck. Learn to accept the challenge. Learn to raise your standards. Learn to focus on serving the client and those obstacles and challenges do not, will not appear to be as big a problem to you as they seem to be. That's my promise to you. Okay, that's my soapbox today. Real estate is results oriented business. We get paid to give the customer a check at the end. If you can't do that, you're in the wrong business. But here's what I'll tell you. If you can 
sign up to that, commit to doing the best you can. You're making a lot of money and build a lot of wealth. A lot of money. Smiling ear to ear. Okay, questions, challenges on this or anything else? Hey, Chris Russell, how you doing, man? I haven't seen you in a while. Very good, Bill. How's it going? Great. How's multifamily investing going? Oh, it's, it's been going great, man. Yeah. So, really well. The only challenge is finding more properties. That's the thing. It's a, it's a little tough right now, but, um, you know, we're still swinging, so. You know, the thing that I tell investors is it, it, it just is a pendulum that shifts where you do the work. If you're a wholesaler or investor, true or false, it's much harder to find good deals today. True. True or false, if you find a good deal, it's much easier to get the finance or finding. Also true. So if you work twice as hard finding deals, you'll work half as much getting deals close. This deal, it wasn't really that hard to close because the buyer is highly motivated. And they were willing to put up with a lot of delays and problems. So again, don't be dissuaded by the fact it's hard to find a good deal right now. It's hard to get listings, true or false, true. When I get a listing that sells like that, also true. If you're an investor, hard to find good deals, true. Hard to get a finance. I'm, I'm, I'm Chris's best friend waiting to hear about his next deal. <laughs> he took care of me in December and I'm waiting for the next deal to come up. So if you have a good investment, people will line up to invest money with you, right? Lion, true or false? Hard to find deals right now? When you find deals that get bought right away? Yeah. If it's a good deal. Right? <laughs> yes. And I think that the thing that new investors have to understand is if somebody's not jumping on your deals, it probably is not a deal, right? It's just not that good a deal. Because if it, there's just more money I can't believe the prices people are paying for properties I see in probate court all the time. It, it just baffles me. How could they afford that? I got a great deal on a property for a client of mine. We buy it at $2 million. We're in escrow already over $3 million. But it's a very unique property, very little niche in, real, in the probate real estate. So a couple little risks on we took. Very hard to find those kind of deals. Not worth the effort. It was a lot of work to find it. Twice as much hard, twice hard to find it. It's already in escrow. It wasn't even on the market for a week. So even industrial property sells like that if it's priced right, if it's a good deal. If the numbers don't work, we don't work. Uh, another way to put it, line is the numbers don't work. Mama doesn't get paid. Mama doesn't get the food on the table. Mama's mad. She doesn't work. Okay, good. Well, that's really all I had to talk about specifically. I'm, but I'm also here to help either if you guys have a property under contract, want to share it. Love to hear about it. If you guys have a problem you need, want some help on to get fixed, we're here to do it. How can we help you guys today? And here's what I'll tell you. The more you participate, the more money you make. No? Well, I want to say that um, I became a, a full-time real estate agent in August, and I finally got a house under contract for a buyer. So I'm very excited about that. Fantastic. Congratulations, Candy. Thank you. Tell us, how did you get the buyer? Um, through referrals and social media. What kind of referral? Uh, uh, she is actually another EXP realtor in Hawaii. And she looked me up. She was looking for her brother. And she um, reached out, and that's how I got him. He's moving here from Salt Lake City, Utah. So it's an out-of-state buyer. EXP, the power of the network. Yes, absolutely. Very nice. Very nice. I love it. Fantastic. Well, welcome. Welcome to the team. Thank you. Look at Lion's happy. He can do the work and he's happy. He's smiling. <laughs> I know. <laughs> hey, don't spend the money yet, Lion. That's still care. That's still counting his property. Yeah, exactly. Deal. You need to get to work, man. <laughs> And the, the housing here is ridiculous. The, the market is, is outrageous here. Our best friends moved to, um, uh, what's the place, on South, South Park, Las Vegas, um, Henderson, and uh, lived there, moved a year ago, and been making offers, uh, recently got into escrow and something, and they backed out when they got to the property, it was just 
way more work and way different than they had thought it was. But um, I know it's a very competitive market in Las Vegas. The greater Las oh, Vegas. Very. Area. Anything under five, it's not on the market very long at all. Yeah. Within a week, it's it's under contract. Yeah. Yeah, and the agents try to double end the deals. They kind of hide it for themselves, and it's it's a whole it's a whole thing. Cool. Um, who else uh, has good news reports? Success you can share with us today. Hey, Melissa Yuloa, nice to see you. Good to see you, Bill. How are you? Good. Still, we're still in mask uh, in uh, the office. Well, we're following Cal OSHA, and until they say it's cool to take off the mask, we're gonna take it off. Then. <laughs> what if I say it's cool to take off the mask? I would do it in a heartbeat. There you go. It's super hot. <laughs> hey, there we go. Nice to see you. Well, welcome. Um, so, what's, can you share some good news with us? I know you're working. You're working all the time, setting up new clients. Lose yeah, some, win so some, lose some, win some. I do have some good news. I think this year, um, I really want to commit to try and do my first um, deal. I've been trying to do door knocking and get some, you know, maybe some good off market deals. I have one that I'm trying to work in uh, the, the Redondo Beach area. It's like, I think like 30 doors of multifamily. So I'm trying to just agree on a good price because they're deferred maintenance some non paying tenants. And of course he's like, well, the land's so, you know, priceless. I'm like, yes, but the fact is, is we have a lot of tenants that have been there for years and we're still in the moratorium. So I'm hoping that this year I'm going to end up doing my first deal. And then um, I'm trying to work closely with some um, individuals from this group, other groups, and I'm going to try to get my own um, feet on the ground for a, a networking group in person. So nice. Yeah. As long we're as people are comfortable. <laughs> it's hard to get out. You know, I'm, I'm one of those. Uh, I have people all the time to call me when they want to meet for lunch or coffee. And it's like, it's just too comfortable working in the office. I just don't really want to go anywhere. Um, it's I just know. too efficient. You know, I don't have to drive anywhere. I have to wait. I don't have to park the car. I have to spend money on the car. Gas. Um, it's just too Gas convenient. is horrendous. I get it. You know, I was driving out to the Sizzler that you told me about when we first started meeting. And uh, I was trying to be consistent with that. But yeah, then I looked at my gas charges and I said, oh, man, I need to cut that out for a little bit. <laughs> Sizzler. Yeah, definitely. It was a, that was a fun meeting to go to. I used to go. I go to court every morning and then I would, I would um, from downtown LA, take the 101 to the Valley. And so it was kind of like halfway there already. Uh, it was, it was halfway convenient. Now it actually just drive to the Valley. I remember the last time I was in the Valley. I can't even tell you when it was. It's just, and, and it's only 20 minutes. It's not that far away, but it's like mentally, it's like another world. Some of the old uh, OG people that go are always say, where's Bill? Bill doesn't want to come here anymore. <laughs> He's too comfortable coming out. <laughs> no, you know, I really don't. I go, you know, the truth is I, I, I um, used to uh, work out in the morning and now I do it at noon. It's nice to go out, sunshine out and get in, I go for either swim or walk. And to give that up means I either have to swim at 6 a.m. where it's cold and dark out. Or I can just walk at noon and blow off the scissor meeting. Exactly. So Take a, just a good afternoon break, actually, for once in your life, right? <laughs> so Stephanie remembers when gas was a buck fifty. Stephanie, I remember when gas was thirty nine cents. How's that one? On Whittier Boulevard in, in the city of Whittier, my dad would take us to the Gulf Station. It was a big deal when they bought out some local independent, and it was a national chain. Gulf was Gulf, gas was thirty nine cents a gallon. Buck fifty was a lot back in uh, as in college nineteen. 80 and uh but yeah gas buck 50 a gallon those are the days okay who else has a question challenge problem anything else we could i mean we could wrap up early i just over here we're all together who's got some good news report who's got property to sell you don't have problems you're not working hard enough i'll tell you that lion go so, ahead uh, yeah i have a kind of a question get a take on this so 99 percent of the things that i've been doing are all uh, dealing with uh, people I don't know, website, marketing, they um, contact. At uh, this property, I have a friend that lives in another state and I don't do too much virtual wholesaling, but they had a renter, home was destroyed, they fixed it up themselves. And I was just wondering, is it advantageous to get involved with like a friend um, to probably end up doing it as a burr? I, I've just never dealt with friends. I don't know if that ruins things or how to approach that a little different than I would, you know, calling or contacting someone. Well, why would you, if, so is it a good investment deal potentially? 
I personally think the numbers and everything looks good, but I've never done a burr. So that's probably another hesitation. I've right. just always bought and sold. I've never kept the property. So you don't know if it's a good deal. You think it might be a good deal. Yeah, yeah. Is that your really friend uh, an experienced investor? Uh, so no, they are on an investor. He's a firefighter. And okay. he just had another home. Him and his wife got married. They kept his home. He rented it out. Um, it got basically destroyed and then it got um, flipped or built back up. And now he just wants to get rid of it. He doesn't want to have two mortgages. So if he just wants to sell it then. So so yes. someone wants to sell a property and you're thinking maybe I should bring a friend in to buy it from that other person? Yeah, and I just don't know if, you know, me getting involved directly, if something does go wrong or, uh, you know, that's what we do. Though. Just... We, we get in the middle and we solve problems. That's what that's how you get paid. Right. We get paid to get in the middle. Right. So I'd say, yeah, I mean, now where's the property located? It's in Indiana. OK, so you're not licensed in Indiana, but you're a wholesaler. So you could find some sort of a wholesale deal, perhaps. Why would you not? Uh, you know, I, I always feel like you have to let um, you have to let the customer make the decision and inform them as best you can. If you're not knowledgeable about, you know, how to calculate a, a property for hold for, for a bird type thing, well, a rehab project, then either you need to give them the resources or find somebody who on their own can make that decision. If they're not sure. capable of making the decision, they just won't buy it. Right. Right. But somebody here might. So what you might do is just put the property information out there and find an investor who would buy that property in that market and put them together. Gotcha. I mean, I don't buy in Indiana, but I have, I have a friend who might. So I would say, and on this call, come. you know, you have to give that the property address, but give us the numbers and say, yeah. if you're interested in this investment, contact me and I'll put you together and make a few in the middle. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay, good. Um, got a question from Christopher. Does anybody have an experience purchasing an heir's interest in a probate, specifically the documents required other than an assignment of interest? I'm not aware of anything besides assignment of interest. Um, so when you say purchasing an heir's interest, that's how it's done. It's assigned in exchange for some compensation. As far as I know, I'm not an attorney, but I've seen it done many times, and that's the that's the process they use. What authority does the order pointing and administrator confer? They're different than the letters of test letters of administration. I think they're the same. I think that you're you're describing the same document using different words. So the authority one gets is either as an administrator or an executor. Executor is named in the document. Administrator is not named in the document. And uh, letters is just another form. You know, I think back in the 60s, when the probate court was created, they created two different forms, but they basically do the same thing. You have the court order for signing the authority, and then you have the letters of testamentary or te letters of administration. I think they basically do the same thing. So um, I don't know, Chris, we're on the call. That does that answer your question? I, I don't think it's much more complicated than that. And again, that only applies to California. There is an order appointing the administrator, then the administrator takes the order, obtaining the bond, and then obtains the letters. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, this is done differently in different counties and different states, but in, I would say in LA, uh, you get a minute order, which means the court kind of put in some notes saying you were granted authority, and then the attorney prepares an order, uh, the judge will sign it, and the, the, um, the uh, it will sign if there's if there's a bond required or not, and then if it's, you need a bond, then you come back with a bond and they sign the letters of authority. Correct. But it's all kind of the same process unless you're delaying it for some reason. Okay, good. Any other questions? I see some new faces on the call. Glad to have you guys on here. Um, Shelly, I don't think we've met before, have we? No, no, we haven't. Where, where are you from? What do you do? I'm in Whittier, I'm with EXP, and I'm a new, newer agent, first year. Wow, I grew up in La Habra, went to La Habra High School. Oh, we live right on the border of La Habra. And my father had, was an attorney in Whittier for many years at Whittier and Kalima. So I knew Whittier very well. Very nice, well, welcome. Oh, yeah, your hometown. Technically, La Habra is my hometown, but Whittier is next city over. Whittier is like the big city we went to for movies or for Bob's Big Boy, like for big, the big event for us to get out. Um, okay, here's a link to a property if anyone's interested. So uh, there's a property Lion has uh, put in the chat box. If you're interested in that property, uh, you can contact him. So there's a bunch of photos. Um, I don't see any kind of, okay. So, you know, I, I think um, Lion, what I would normally do on a property like that is kind of just put a spreadsheet with the income 
expenses and, and you try to find a format of a calculator that works for you that calculates out the return on investment. So, okay. uh, and then in this case, if it's a burr, you're talking about buying it in some sort of rehab budget, estimate the budget, and then somebody can look at this and figure out. There's two questions people always ask is what's it gonna cost me to get in? And what am I gonna get out of it at the end? If you can't gotcha. ask, answer those two questions, they're not gonna invest with you. Okay. What's my total Perfect. cost in, which is the down payment, closing costs, rehab costs, carrying costs. And then at the end when I sell it, how much will I get? And then what percentage of all that money is, is my profit? Perfect, thank you. Okay. And I, like Bigger Pockets has some calculators. If you just search online, you'll find some investment calculators. If I find one that you like, and then just, and it also, and I think the discipline of, of doing that will force you to evaluate a deal and know if you have something or not. Because I oftentimes get things sent to me by investors. I say, oh, I have a great deal. And I used to you know, be enthusiastic. I filled the numbers for them. And I realized, well, this doesn't even break even. Why would I buy it? Um, and so you have to really make sure that you would have credibility when you present a property to somebody. And you want to be able to say, look, this property, you can invest 50000 and you'll, a year and a half later, you'll get back a check for 90000 and, and that cracks it out to, to X percentage. OK? And YouTube to talk about property packages. Yes, uh, there's some different investors. There's a, there's a lender I interviewed from a, a dude who does commercial loans who talks about a calculator she provided. Um, there's different calculators I've, I've gone through on my website before. Thank you for the shout out, Melissa. Any other questions, problems, challenges? Hey, Bill. What's up, Dimitri? So, uh, I don't really have a, uh, a con like a problem or anything like that, but um, I just wanted to put it out there in the chat. Uh, I wrote something earlier. I'm pretty new in real estate. I'm in the process of getting my real estate license right now. Nice. And um, I think what I really want to focus on right now, I'm in the downtown LA area. I'm just looking to see if there's anyone that has any Airbnbs or uh, someone I could work with. I'm looking to get into the Airbnb space. Um, so I, my information is in the chat. If anyone wants to connect, uh, just let me know. Great, thanks. I know Lee Lin, uh, she reached out to you on the, on the chat. Yep, 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 we spoke. Good. Yeah, nice guy. I just had chat, a little interview with her uh, for this week. So she's definitely somebody you want to connect with. Yeah, and, I just uh, messaged him. So. Oh, good. Okay, good. And so real quick, I apologize, Bill. Something also, if anyone does not know, Vegas is really opening up for different things. So we just got the Raiders. We've got the professional hockey team, and we're about to get the professional baseball team. So Airbnbs here will probably be a really big commodity because we got three professional teams here within the last two years. You also had NAS you have a NASCAR race every year too now. Yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah, we had a NASCAR race in LA at the Coliseum. Anybody see that? That was a lot of fun. Um, they they dug out the bottom of the Coliseum and made a NASCAR track, a short track. Hard to believe it would fit in there, but that was uh, for the NASCAR. That was a lot of fun. Dave, hands up. Go ahead. Uh, well, I will let everybody know that I have um, some regular flow of uh, <laughs> off-market wholesale properties here in the Los Angeles, Southern California area. And uh, so I'm looking for cash buyers on that. And um, there's people that are prepared to close the transaction relatively quickly. There, there's a lot of competition, as you can imagine, uh, for those kinds of properties. So when they come up, we have a list of folks that are qualified and have the uh, desire. And we reach out to everybody. Very nice. So I do, I'm on my phone right now. And I apologize. I don't have the ability to, or the, I don't know how to put my phone number or anything in the chat room. Um, so I'm usually using my laptop or something. So, um, well, the bottom of your phone or the bottom right there, you hit the little buttons and then it brings you, there's a chat option, hit the chat and it's right in there. FYI. Oh, there we go. Look at that. There you go. Okay. Uh, thanks, line, Bill. you got a little shout out here from Shelly. Does Las Vegas have any restrictions against short term rentals? STRs are short term rentals. Are you aware? Not that I'm aware of at the moment. I know certain, uh, the city doesn't. I know certain neighborhoods and HOAs kind of frown upon it, um, and they've been talking about it. But as far as I know, at the moment, there's no regulations um, citywide on it. Yeah, Las Vegas doesn't seem to have much restrictions on much. <laughs> they want the money. They know. That's they the want money. the money. If you can, if you can pay some taxes, then you are good. I think, uh, in just general rule, uh, as opposed to California, where the answer is just no to anything you want to do, um, which is crazy. The regulations we have here in California just. By the day, get more. I was listening to a compliance discussion, and this this uh, person was was uh, 
explain the Department of Real Estate's requirements for disclosure. And it's true that when we do initial reach out, we're supposed to have our um, Department of Real Estate number available. So if I you know, do an email, it should be in my signature line, or if I do an advertisement, it's supposed to be, on my, it is on my website, it's supposed to be in the emails that you send out to people. But she said, you know, on every YouTube. And I said, oh, you mean like on the banner, you know, on the bottom right? No, no, on every thumbnail, she's saying, you have to have the DR number of views, the agent and the broker, and it can't be the smallest font on the, it can't be smaller than the smallest font on the ad. I'm thinking on a YouTube thumbnail, you're going to put two, you know, eight digit numbers. That's California. We just, we just it's absolutely, it's crazy and getting crazier by the day. And there's another, there's a bill now in the assembly to charge 25% surcharge on flippers. If you have short-term capital gains, then we'll charge 25%. It's not approved, it's not signed, but that's how all these things start. So one day you hear about the stupid idea, next thing you know, it's the law. So just be aware in California that it's um, getting very challenging to, to, to do business. And, and me as a listing agent, I'm fine with that because the more people move out, the more houses for sale. So people are going to die and people are going to sell their house at some point. But it is a challenge. I think we all have to think about how do you, how do you, how's it going to affect your business in the long run? And maybe it means you move to Vegas. That's another option. Wesley Harris, thanks for your contact info. Nice seeing you, Wesley. The voice of real estate in Southern California. Okay. Any oh, other I, I forgot to unmute myself. I, oh. I appreciate you calling me out. Uh, I'm working in the Phoenix area with a guy. We do we help people get into the home ownership, which if you saw 60 minutes Sunday night, they're talking about all the people who are going in and buying these big hedge funds coming in and buying houses and renting them. So you can now, as they put it, rent the American dream, where it used to be you could own the American dream. Well, we help people own the American dream and get into home ownership probably for the first time. And it provides long-term cash flow, tax benefits, high rate of return with market appreciation. And if anybody's curious, I'm always looking for investment partners and I put my information, my contact information in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. It's Wesley Harris, the voice of real estate in Southern California, now the greater <laughs> Phoenix market. If I had a voice like his. Well. And, <laughs> okay. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up. Let's say, anybody else have any challenges, problems, properties you want to pitch? Not hearing any? Was this helpful going through the list of problems? My, my goal here is to say to you, is to challenge you. you know, don't be soft. You know, back in the old days, I, you know, I was born in 1959. I grew up as a young man in the 60s. I'd say, man up. But this <laughs> is the opportunity. You can't say it when half the calls women. And, and, uh, and I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a father of a, of, a, of a woman in the workplace who's done real well. So I, I mean it in a positive way that, you know, if there's one lesson to learn from today, or I guess there's two always. There's one greatest opportunity in my lifetime right now to make money as far as income and wealth. Pony up, she says. Ponytail up. Okay. Um, never been an opportunity like this in real estate. In my, I, I just, it's just baffling the opportunities in front of us today. Whether it be, and, and it never was possible. Here, Lions talking about making money on a house in Indiana. Wesley in the Valley is talking about making money in Scottsdale. That never existed before, right? We, we started to have the nationalization and and the internationalization. I'm with the XP Realty. We literally have uh, people working for us now in 14 different countries. You can recruit people around the world in our business now. Never been the case before. Greatest opportunity ever to make money in real estate. But number two, um, yeah, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. You're hard yourself. The business will be a lot easier for you. Don't let the obstacles deter you. The obstacles are going to deter your competition if you can get over them. And if you have problems or obstacles, bring them this call. Text or email me if I can help you. But just know if you can learn how to um, get over those obstacles, you'll be the only one able to do that you'll be the one that gets paid. You'll be the one who gets, gets the check at the end of the day. So I'm here to help if I can in any way. I'm Bill Gross on social media, Bill Gross EXP. And you can call, text, or email me. We do this call every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Pacific, which is uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Look forward to having you again next week. I also do on Thursdays, probateweekly.com. We go a little deeper dive on the probate real estate. 